Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today is July 3rd, 2024. We continue with our series, Kingdom Legacy, and today we are in Romans chapter 3 and 4. And just a reminder that we are again the focus is on integrating our faith with our lives. So with that, let's read a portion of Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that every good may come, as we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that that they are all under sin. Now I'm going to stop. That was verses 1 through 9. Let's talk a little bit about this because it jumps in. It can almost be confusing for a second. What's going on? Paul begins, what advantage then has the Jew? And of course, you can refer back to last week. Of course, on the podcast, I mainly focused on just chapter 1. With a little overview of 2. Well, we're picking up in 3, and at the end of chapter 2, Paul began talking about circumcision and the uncircumcised. And here he's picked up with this thought, what advantage has the Jew? What profit is circumcision? And so we have to understand, to the people he's writing to at the time, uh, to be circumcised was to be a Jew, to, a Jew was to be circumcised. Um, the two were almost synonymous. And because of that, they, their political bent, their culture, their identity was tied up into circumcision for Jews instead of their faith. To be Jew was more about being circumcised than it did about their actual belief. And so Paul asked this question, you know, if, if all this is by faith, then what advantage is being Jewish? What profit is circumcision? Paul says, well, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of benefits. And he starts off by saying, for, for beginning, it was committed to them, the oracles of God. In other words, because of the circumcision, they were giving all the oracles, all the word of God. And then he says, for what if some did not believe? See, here Paul is going out after it. To be a member of the circumcision has nothing to do about belief. Now, it did originally. See, Abraham believed God, and that meant something, and therefore he was circumcised as a sign of his belief. But at this point, you can be circumcised without necessarily believing. Today in Christianity, we have people that are baptized in water all the time that do not really believe. And yet, to be baptized in water is a sort of a statement that you're a Christian, you believe. 
So how can you be baptized in water if you don't really believe? Well, people do it all the time. And this is what's happening with circumcision with the Jews that Paul was dealing with. He says, for what if some do not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? He says, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, what's he, what does he mean by that? Just because a Jewish person doesn't believe in God doesn't mean that God's promises to the Jewish people suddenly go away. When God made the covenant with Abraham, it wasn't dependent upon the actions of Abraham. God sealed that covenant himself, meaning that God himself would keep it. it. Didn't depend on Abraham keeping it. God would be the one to keep it. Therefore, if Abraham had children that didn't believe, didn't really matter. God's still going to be faithful to his promise regardless of them. And you see this all through history of, of Israel in the Old Testament. They would believe, they wouldn't believe. And they wouldn't believe, yes, they were punished for that unbelief and their enemies came in and trashed them and they were carried off into exile. There was curses that went with their unbelief. But God was always faithful to his promises even when they were unbelievers. He always sent them deliverers. He always sent them that second chance. They were always getting second chances. And yes, when someone believed and would rise up and, and he would be, become a, a, a deliverer or God would deliver them through other means and there'd be this time of peace. Um, and then they'd go right back to doing what they were doing because they didn't believe. But you see, the promise of God for them was there because it was about God being faithful, not about them or what they thought. That's why it says you may be justified in your words and may overcome them when you are judged. This is like God's the one that's going to be justified. God's, God's going to be the one that's going to overcome at the time of judgment. Uh, and so the next question, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? And so this gets into this whole thing about going, oh, well, if that's true, then we should just do whatever we want to, right? Because it just demonstrates God's good stuff. And Paul says, verse 6, certainly not. No. You know, for for then how will God judge the world? See, God's going to judge the world. You are going to be held accountable for your actions. So this isn't like a free pass. And 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 so he's going after this. Listen, you can't just do evil thinking, well, if I do evil, that just gives God chances to glorify in himself. Um and he gets into that, you know, live um about, you know, no, that's not what this is about at all. Um, matter of fact, that makes condemnation that will come upon us even more just because we deserve it. And so, and again, this is talking about the Jews, you know. And so he gets it in verse 9. So what then? Are we better than they? Are we as believers better than them, the Jews? He says, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So no, just because we're a believer that's a Gentile or Greek doesn't mean we have something better than the Jews. We're both in the same condition under sin. We're going to pick up in verse 10 now. As it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified by his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all on who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to stop right there. We're almost finished with the chapter. But he quotes a large portion of that, uh, verses 10 through 18, was a, a portion quoted from Isaiah 
No one understands. No one seeks after God. No one is righteous. No, not one. And so this is Paul taking this word from Isaiah and he's saying, listen, this this word is not just for Jews and it's not for Gentiles. It's about everyone. No one, no one is free from sin. We are all guilty. This idea of saying, well, or is being a Jew better? Is being a Jew? He's saying it doesn't matter. You, you're neither one's better than the other because you're both under sin. You both, you know, your your tongue, your mouth is full of evil words. Listen to it speak. It, it curses. There's bitterness. It's 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 like a, a poison. And all of us, at some point in our life, has spoken things that's been just poison and death. And there's no fear of God before their eyes. And, of course, you can see that so much happening in our society. People, there's no fear of God. They can just do whatever they want to do. They don't care. And when you try to explain things, they give this, well, I just don't believe that. There's no fear of the consequences to their actions. This is what being under sin is like. Then he goes on to, to he gets about, Listen, it's this way so that every mouth may be stopped. No one will be able to stand before God and, and, and mouth off excuses or justifications. We're all under sin. The whole world is. And the law is there so that when we get there before God on judgment days, it will silence us because we're guilty. We're guilty. Now, remember, we read in the first two chapters that everybody God has revealed himself to everybody there's no excuse everybody has been given the knowledge of God they need to receive him so chapters one and two we really went over that um that's not just saying this no that was error it was the lost the lost don't have an excuse now we're all under this the saying verse 20 therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh is justified. That means there's nothing that we can do in our work that will justify us. And it says, but now there's a righteousness of God that's apart from the law is revealed. In other words, there's righteousness of God that is attainable and it's separate from the law. So you can't attain righteousness through the law. But there is, there is something apart from the law. And it says it's being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So it's funny. The law is a witness. It tells us that there is something outside of itself that will bring on the righteousness of God. The prophets, all the prophets of the Old Testament, prophesied about this. And it's what? Through faith, through even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. Let's pick up there. Verse 23, there is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We, we did read that. Let me pick up verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a lot of big words there, and it can almost, you almost hear it and you go, what? What did he just say? Read that again, and you read it three or four times, and you go, what? What did he just say? Let's pull this down here. We pick up with, we're all, we're all sinners. We all fall short. And then it says, but we're justified freely. It's, you know, when you think just about freely, he didn't, he didn't pay for it by grace, by his grace. And I, I tell people all the time, I, I feel like there's a portion of the church that we lift up grace as God. We make the idol God called grace and we worship at the altar of grace rather than at the feet of Jesus. Listen, grace is something God does. It's not who he is, it's what he does. Um, and, and so 
Here is by his grace. It's the action of God. What is grace? He's showing you unmerited favor. In other words, you didn't deserve something, but he's going to do you. He's going to give you favor anyway. And he did it for free. You know, I know the idea of like, if you have to pay for grace, it's, it's not grace, but grace is unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to earn it. But then he freely gave it on top of that. And so he made this choice. To freely do something we don't deserve. What did he free? Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So redemption was, we didn't deserve this. We're all under sin, but he's going to do it to us anyway. He's going to bring us redemption. You know how? Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Just let me summarize this. I'm not trying to be theological and get an exact, precise definition. definition but for... Just the the average guy listening to this, it just means propitiation is the, the payment that you owed for your sin. It's the payment, you know. So God set forth as a payment for your sin by his blood. So Jesus paid the debt of your sin by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. So you see, we, we obtain that through faith, and he did that to demonstrate his, God's, Jesus' righteousness. Because in his forbearance, forbearance is a lot like patience, but there's a little more to that. Because forbearance, you, you had to bear, you had to endure. You know, I can wait for something patiently, and I don't have to endure anything other than my own uh, I, I'm just in a hurry. I don't want to be patient, you know, so I'm having to deal with maybe my impatience, but you know, if, if I want to, you know, wait till I have to get off work or I have to wait till I, you know, eat dinner. I mean, that's, that's not forbearance. Forbearance is the, you're having to endure or suffer through something patiently. And you see, because of his forbearance, so God is enduring something what? Our sin. He's enduring our sin. He's passed over the sins that were previously committed. See, don't you understand that God endured and suffered through our sin? For thousands of years, he, quote, let us slide. See, he, he, there's, there's a part of God's justice that wanted to take us out immediately upon the sin. But instead, he chose to endure it with forbearance. Why? Because he was going to pay for it himself. And so things that had previously stacked up, he just he just dealt with it. It's like he's like, no, I'm going to do this in my time, my way, not your way, not with impatience. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time, that's where we are here, his righteousness, see the present time, that he might be the, the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, he waited until the right moment that Christ would pay for our sin. And now he can demonstrate his righteousness in that. And then very quickly as we wrap up this chapter, so where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Again, he's taking on some of these arguments about, you know, where's in where where's all the boasting about this? Um, I know some brothers out there are going, well, if you can't even say you believe because that's a work. Uh, no, that's not a work. If anything, I'm bragging on God for doing the work. Um, you know, that's why he says, where's the boasting then? Well, it's excluded. Boasting is excluded, you know, um, by what law of works? You see, we can't, we can't brag on anything because we don't do anything to obtain it. God, Jesus, has done everything. There's nothing in the law that we can boast on because the law is only condemns us. There's no boasting in that. There's nothing we can do. And so it says, no, but by the law of faith. 
Ah, the law of faith. We can boast in the law of faith. Because when you boast in the law of faith, you brag on Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So your boast becomes a testimony of how God saved you. But what did Jesus do on the cross? It's I did nothing. He did everything. And I believe. I believe that. That's the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. But the law of faith, you believe in Christ and it just works. And it's separate. It has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with the law. It's a, a, a completely separate entity. You know, it's a separate program. You know, the, the law is one computer program and then the, the law of faith is something totally different. You know, you run the law, the, the program with the laws, and you always lose that game. You always lose that game. You run the program with the law of faith, and you suddenly always win. Because your faith justifies you. And then, verse 29, or is he the God of the Jews only? See, this gets into the whole thing about what advantage of being a Jew. He's brought this whole thing. It's like going, listen, did, did he just do this for Jews? Was all the promises and all this stuff for, is just for the Jews only? He goes, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he made the Gentiles. He made, he's the God of us all. There's not some other God that created different people. It's one God that made everything. And he goes, yes, all the Gentiles, since there's one God. There's only one God. He made us all. He's everyone's God. There's only one. There's not multiple gods. There's only one. And it says, and he will justify the circumcised by faith. So those that are Jews and they're circumcised, guess what? They get to be justified by faith. By faith. If they can take all these promises and all these oracles of God and everything they've been given, and then by their faith in these promises, they can look at Jesus and by that faith that they've been given, they can believe and be justified. And the uncircumcised through faith. See, the uncircumcised, those are like myself. Gentiles didn't grow up, didn't know, didn't have any of this, didn't know any of this stuff in life. And yet when we, when we see, when we hear the gospel message through that faith, we receive, we put our faith in that. And through that, that we've now given to that through that, we receive this justification from God. Verse 31. So do then we make the law, Void through faith. See, a lot of people are going, oh, does that mean the law's gone? The law's gone. We just have faith. No, the law's not gone. It says, certainly not on the contrary, we establish the law. You see, Jesus fulfilled the law. To fulfill it, he has to... The, the propitiation, the payment for sin, doesn't mean anything without the law. It's meaningless. See, we have to have the law established so that... What the sacrifice was done means something, that he fulfilled all that stuff. No, we don't have to do the law. Jesus did all. We believe in him and we share in what he's accomplished and he, he justifies us. And those blessings, his, his, the life that he has comes to us. And all of our sin that needs to be punished by Sin, he, he's taken that to the cross. The law is established. It is justified. It is, it is, is, is justified. In other words, you know, the law is established. My sin was nailed to the cross. It, went, it, it was put on the cross. It was paid for. If it wasn't established, then who took care of it? Where did it go? It's, 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 it's a sort of a crazy thing to think about. We often don't want to. Now I'm gonna. I am trying to keep this under thirty minutes, so let me um, let me skim through a little bit here. Um, for we won't get through all of it, but let's look at some of it. it. Says, "What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and was accounted to him for righteousness." Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. 
Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So here, again, he's wrapping up that portion of the argument, going back to Abraham, that he, he believed that's where he was justified. It wasn't in Abraham's works. You read about Abraham in the Old Testament. He, he made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of things wrong. But he believed, and that was accounted to him for righteous. And because Abraham believed in his kind of righteousness, that's when the covenant was made and the circumcision came as a sign that he'd already received the righteousness. It's, it's like water baptism. We're supposed to receive that after we receive salvation as a sign, as a witness that we have confessed and been washed clean of our sin. And that's why in verse 4 says, Now to him who works, wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So when you go to work, um, your, your boss, your employer, doesn't give you money uh, for unmerited favor. You know, that's what grace is, unmerited favor. And those, he's not paying you because you did nothing. Unmerited favor didn't matter what you do, you're going to get it anyway. I know that's what most unions here in the U.S., that's what they want. They want just unmerited, you know, you don't have to work. You just show up and they have to pay you. But that's not how it works. You go to work and you do something, and now your employer, your boss, owes you money. You provided a work service. Now they owe you. They're in debt to you. That's that's law. That's not how grace works. To him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. In other words, there's not we can't do a work and God owe you. That's why you can't work and get rid of your sin. Because to do that would mean God would have to owe you. God doesn't owe you anything. You owe God. God, ha- God has to make the payment, not you. Um, and so you, you don't do anything. You just believe. And on, on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is... In other words, we just believe in Jesus who's making the payment for you. And because of that, you he makes the payment for you. Now you're you've been justified. And it's your faith in him to do that is why it brings righteousness to you. And of course, they quote a prophecy from uh, a word from David in the Psalms. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. It, 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 it's David saying like here, it's, it's a miracle. God doesn't give you what you deserve. He, he it, it's, it's, it's a miracle. And of course, chapter four goes on. It compares this with circumcision, uncircumcision. Uh, why Abraham became the father of all nations. And of course, the, the big point is, is, is he's getting to his faith. Let's go down to verse uh, 20. I'm going to read out 20 to the end. Talk about Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Beautiful ending here. Going again to Abraham. I know I've skipped over a lot. But he's wrapping up and getting that that Abraham, he he believed, he clung to the promises of God. And that's what strengthened him was he just believed God. He says he was fully convinced that God was able to perform what he promised. And there was a lot of things. You can go back and read the Old Testament and all, all that stuff there. But you see, God took that belief and and imputed, gave away righteousness to Abraham because of that. And that's for us. You know, when we believe, we are believing the promise that when Jesus said he's going to go to the cross to pay for our sin, and we, we, we believe that. We believe that he's 
able to do that. We believe he was capable of doing it. We believe he did that. We believe that when we stand before God on the day of judgment, that Jesus Christ will do exactly that, what he promised, which is I have taken your sin. I will cleanse you. I will, you will be perfect and spotless and blameless before him. That we will be his children, his heirs, his brothers and sisters. And he goes on to say, and specifically, this wasn't just done to Abraham for Abraham, but for anyone who believes in Jesus, who was raised from the dead. See, he was delivered up for us and our sins, but was raised from the dead for our justification. Father, we just thank you for today, God, that we're able to look at your word, God. Father, I thank you for the day that we can look at your word, God. And yes, it can be rough hearing about how all of us were in sin, that we were all lost, God, that to learn about the breakdown of our society, God, the, how sin can take us into the depths of darkness, God, and we're all in it, God, and we're all thick of it. And God, those first three chapters can be so dark. But Father, there's a turn that's beginning to happen here, God, that, that, that your son, Jesus, has justified freely, God, and we don't have to work for it, God, that he's accomplished uh, something great for us, God, the, to, to, to cleanse us of sin, God, to have righteousness come down upon us, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for this revelation. And as we go through, God, help us to apply this into our lives as we live, God. Let it not just be some head knowledge thing, God, but help it to get down into our hearts, God, and to change our life, God, and how we live. And we thank you, God for never giving up on us in Jesus name. Well, we thank you for listening to this podcast. You can check out other teachings at our website at www.christianimpact.net. And until next time, God bless. Bye.